Kevin Marlam uh, from the Democratic Alliance is the Shadow Minister of Minerals and Energy. And in this edition of Undictated, we dig into the Russian bank Gazprom Bank's appointment to fund a $200 million refurbishment of the Moss Gas Refinery and Cabinet's announcement of a 2,500 megawatt nuclear build determination. Lots of questions. Kevin, this is not just a burst into the public arena. This has been in gestation for quite some time. Uh, starting off with the nuclear build, we had, well, a potentially bankrupt making nuclear proposal that Jacob Zuma uh, attempted to push through and, in fact, fired a finance minister over it. As we know, that was goes back to 2015. That seemed to have been stopped, but it's now come back front and center. And the other story is to do with Mosgas, where your colleague, um, James Lorimer, has been telling us, exciting us about the prospects off the Southern Cape Coast, which would make South Africa uh, the, the next great oil and gas province in the world. And it appears as though South Africa is giving the Russians a inside track on both of these issues. Now, you've raised some questions, not just today, but for a long time. But today, you are actually asking for those questions or some of the questions to be answered. Just explain what, what this PAIA is about, what it means, and why you've gone that route. So uh, a PIA request, a Promotion of Access to Information Act request, is a request on government to provide documents, specific documents, relating to their record of decision, both on the the nuclear determination, in other words, the Section 34 determination made by the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy uh, and or Minister of Electricity, uh, Swutla Ramakopa, uh, to provide all the, the documentation related to that record of decision. And then we put in another PIA request to provide all the bid criteria, the uh, scoring, and all the related documents regarding the Petro SA Gazprom Bank deal. So we want to see the rationality of those decisions. And if uh, if there's any question over the rationality, they may well be taken on review. Let's start with the second one first. There were other bidders, presumably, to fund the refurbishment of Moscas, uh, and yet this Russian bank was the only one that uh, passed all the criteria. Sounds a little bit like what happened at Madupi and Kusili, and we know how that worked out when the ANC fiddled around with the requirements to make sure there was only one winner. So you need to go back about about a year. Uh, there were a number of, of uh, what they call unsolicited bids to refurbish the Petro SA refinery in, in Mossel Bay. Now, we need to understand that that refinery has been mothballed since about 2020 because of a lack of feedstock. In other words, they couldn't get the raw materials they needed to do the refining and produce uh, their end product. And they haven't been able to source that feedstock anywhere. So the, 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 the refinery itself was mothballed, and that has an enormous impact on the local economy, um, not, not just in, in terms of direct jobs, but also in terms of secondary industry, everything from tires and petrol uh, to food and, and the like is, is obviously uh, impacted by a plant of that size that shuts down that's the single biggest employer in, in that area. So it, it's a critical uh, entity and it needs, to be, it needs to be looked at how we can, we can move forward and resuscitate that economy. But as I said, the, the, the feedstock supply was a problem and they then shut the refinery down and, and mothballed it. To get it up and running again, they need to go through a, quite an extensive refurbishment process and that's exactly what this request for proposal, this tender, was for. So there were some unsolicited bids and the Petro SA board then decided they would open up a formal bid process 
but that people who had submitted unsolicited bids in the last six months need not reapply. They put in place quite a strict tender process, and one of the criteria was that uh, you got additional points, you got bonus points if the the bidder was a state-owned entity or supported by a state-owned entity. Effectively, what happened was that 19 out of the 20 bids were disqualified, leaving only Gazprom Bank, the, the finance arm of Russian state-owned entity Gazprom, as the only qualifying bidder. Kevin, help me out here. The whole world is issuing sanctions against anyone who does business with Russia. Are we not running that risk? <laughs> Absolutely. So it's not a, a case of direct sanctions. It would be what, what are called secondary sanctions. Um, and it would be things like we would be excluded from AGOA, the uh, American Growth and Opportunities Act uh, that, that finances or, or supports so many of our trade deals with the U.S., uh, but it it's not something that is is imminent. It's it's a potential risk. Now, National Treasury warned of this. The Petro SA board were warned of it, and they decided to go against it. And cabinet went against that advice as well. That uh, this was a, a a risk that they needed to consider. So let's just be very clear on this. There were twenty potential bidders. The one who won the the business is a state owned or supported by a state owned enterprise from Russia. And it is now um, bringing in all kinds of new risks. And the others were effectively precluded from looking into this. The whole thing just, just smells to high heaven. What are you hoping that the Pyre request is going to reveal for you? Well, one of the things that we were particularly interested in is how the scoring was conducted, what scores were awarded, and uh, what other bidders were, were part of the process. That's, that's one of the things that we're very interested in. The other is, where is this new refinery going to source its feedstock from? Now, you spoke earlier about the Brawlpada and Leipat fields about 160 kilometers south of Mossel Bay. The production rights on those fields are owned by Total Energy. Unfortunately, PetroSA has not secured a supply agreement with Total. Uh, there's been some issues over pricing. We need to understand that those fields are quite a long way offshore. They're in very rough waters. They're in very deep waters. And that production has not yet started on those fields. So even in a best case scenario, we're probably looking at five to six years before uh, there would be any feedstock coming from those fields. But they haven't secured that supply. So then the question is, well, where does the supply come from? And given that Gazprom Bank is the finance arm of Gazprom, the Russian oil and gas supplier, you start saying, well, it's going to come from Russia. And this is probably a way of Russia whitewashing its, its uh, oil and gas supply through PetroSA. It does add significant costs to, to the, the issue because obviously there's a long transport line from, from where the, the oil and gas is produced to get it to Mossel Bay. But equally, there's, there's a whole other issue, and that is Gazprom would be winning both on the front end in the supply of, of feedstock to PetroSA and on the back end because they would be getting a share of the profits from the refurbished refinery. So you, you, you kind of have to ask, well, who's benefiting and why? Um, and why would, why would Russia be so interested in such a small refinery? You know, most refineries that are in production these days are in the 600,000 barrels a day production range. PetroSA is producing 45,000 barrels. The biggest refinery in the world is in India. It's 1.2 uh, million barrels a day. And, and so PetroSA is completely small fry, but it does give, give uh, the Russians a, a, a place to move their oil and, and, and gas and, and uh, as I said, whitewash their feedstock. And potentially also a foothold in this new prospective area. Kevin, before we move off this, 
Are these the same people who sold South Africa's strategic oil reserves at the bottom of the market, below the market price? No, PetroSA didn't sell off the, the strategic oil reserves. That was the strategic fuel fund. However, and this is where it starts getting messy, is that the new South African National Petroleum Company that is being mooted is a merger of PetroSA, the Strategic Fuel Fund, and IGAS. And uh, so the Strategic Fuel Fund would be part of this new entity that would be uh, an owner of all of that. But that was a Strategic Fuel Fund that sold off those oil reserves. Wow, not a great track record. Okay, just moving one, on Alex, to nuclear. and Just before we move on to the nuclear, so there is the other issue that, that this deal does raise, that this is a sweetener for the potential nuclear deal, that this is a way for Russia to get their foot in the door and, and sweeten the potential nuclear deal that we're about to talk about. Wheels within wheels. We always have to look beyond the obvious. On this nuclear deal, 2,500 megawatts, first of all, how relevant is that in the whole uh, energy picture in South Africa? <laughs> that's, a, that's a brilliant question because our electricity crisis is, is immediate. It's, it's something that is ongoing. It's something that we need to sort out now. We have a shortfall of somewhere in the range of about 6 megawatts of electricity at any given time of, 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 of electricity supply that we need to to meet. Now, building a nuclear power plant is not something you do overnight. Uh, in the presentation yesterday, Minister Ramakopa, and it was quite interesting that he was the one who gave the presentation, given that Minister Mantashe is the one who should make that determination. But in his presentation yesterday, he indicated that it would take 10 to 12 years to build this, this plant. Um, that's, that's quite an optimistic timeline. And you can ask the French at Flamanville or the British at Hinkley, both of which are years behind schedule, uh, how long it, it actually takes to build a nuclear power plant. Uh, but either way, he then said it will be adding new nuclear to the grid in 2033. Well, considering we're at the end of 2023 and the tender is only going to go out in the middle of 2024, you know, the earliest on, on the most optimistic time scale that you're looking at is 2035 that, that you would see uh, any electricity coming to the grid. That doesn't solve our immediate electricity crisis. And we should be looking at exactly what we can do to add more megawatts to our grid now, not in 10 years' time. I'm not saying ignore the, the long term, but I'm saying the crisis is, is, is immediate. Yo. And nuclear has also been notoriously um, full of corrupt practices. doesn't matter how long you want to look at it, uh, especially the, the guys making the decisions today are going to be long gone, one would expect, by the time the nuclear plant comes on. But, but why, are, again, or how do the Russians have an inside track on this one? So first of all, you were, and, and you mentioned it right at the beginning of the show, um, but you will recall that in 2015, 2016, we had a signed deal with Rosatom, the Russian Atomic Energy Agency. And they are the ones that are pushing hardest to develop nuclear technology and build nuclear power plants in Africa. In fact, they've got uh, a couple of deals already inked across Africa. So they're the, they're the most visible. Equally, you have people like Minister Gwede Mantashe who are strong p proponents of a Rosatom solution. So immediately alarm bells start ringing that, that this is something that is already decided that they are going to be the preferred bidder. So we, we need to have a look at exactly how that, that tender gets worded to, to see that there is a fair and competitive process. Before we even get to the tender process, we need to look at how did they get to the decision that they got to, that we need 2,500 megawatts of new nuclear now. Um, we need to interrogate the rationality of that decision. The, the current integrated resource plan, which we've spoken about before, the IRP, is, is South Africa's roadmap for electricity. And the current IRP was, was gazetted in 2019. In that, in that IRP, 
makes provision for 2,500 megawatts of nuclear, new nuclear. Um, but it says that we must commence preparations for the procurement of, of that technology at a pace and scale the country can afford. That's, that's the wording of the IRP. When NURSA gave its concurrence to the minister in September 2022 on this determination, it did so with a couple of suspensive conditions. The first was that it had to be at a pace and scale that, that the country could afford. And secondly, they, the Department of Energy, the Minister of Energy, had to demonstrate the rationality of the decision. They had to show a demand profile and a load generation profile to meet that demand um, for the year 2030. And we have not seen that, that, that information yet. We haven't seen any cost analysis. We haven't seen, we, we haven't seen a feasibility study on, on any of this. So the rationality of this determination remains very, very much up in the air. It strikes me that this is, is a political play that the ANC are trying to get these deals inked before the elections next year uh, as a, an insurance policy to, first of all, line their own pockets. We, we all know that the ANC is, for all intents and purposes, bankrupt, but, but equally to, to ensure that the deals are put in place before they potentially lose power in 2024. In uh, Andre Dorato's book, he unpacks exactly what happened with Madupi and Kusili and that the ANC itself got more than 100 million rand in bonus from the company Hitachi, uh, which was sanctioned in the uh, US as well for being corrupt. More than 100 million rand bonus when the deal was done. Is there something from the way you're looking at it that you are hoping to see in the prior requests which will expose this or would they be as, um, as as brash to even discuss those kind of things openly? I think it's a little bit early to to, to expect to see that in the prior request. Uh, what we're, we're looking at in this point at this point is the the way the decision was made, what what considerations were taken into account, uh, what weighed in, in in the favor of taking the decisions that they took. We won't see anything directly in the PIA request that says, well, we're taking this decision because we're going to get a kickback of however many millions or billions uh, out of it. So I don't think we'll see that that there. But I do anticipate that there, there will be a, a, a structuring of the project model that money will go to connected firms, to to cronies and the like. We saw it in... in uh, in the previous nuclear build, that some of the the consultants that were brought on board and paid hundreds of millions of rands were very very closely connected to Jacob Zuma and and to the ANC in general, and uh, then you then you start saying, well, it's not going to be a direct payment from from let's say Gazprom to to the ANC. It it's in all likelihood going to be a payment to a consultant and then a, from the consultant. A donation to the ANC, Kevin. Uh, it it's, makes people terribly despondent in South Africa to see the corruption that's going on. But I suppose those with long memories will say, "Well, the National Party did the same thing in, ahead of the 1994 election. They pushed through uh, quite a few of their deals." So, on the upside, if the ANC is worrying about losing power, even with the support that it'll likely be getting from the Russians to fight this election, it must show that the potential for change in South Africa is very real. Well, I believe the potential is very real. My party believes the potential is very real. We are certainly working day and night to ensure that a better government comes into place in 2024 um, and that uh, an accountable government comes into place. Um, and one of the things that we need to look at is what are the, what are the ministers? What are the executive doing? Uh, what are their where are their performance agreements? Why are they not being made public? We need to ensure that we hold our executive accountable, that they report to parliament, uh, and that that the administration 
is not made up of political cronies. That uh, the, the the policy of cater deployment uh, that, that that comes to an end, and that the best people for the job are then put into place to ensure that we don't have these failing state-owned entities. You just have to look at the track record of of SAA, SABC, the post office, ESCOM, Transnet. I, I mean, the list goes on. Petro SA. The list goes on and on and on. And uh, we spent hundreds of billions bailing these entities out, and they're still no better off 10, 15 years down the line than they were uh, back in 2007. This country deserves much better. This uh, episode of Un- Undictated with Kevin Milam, the Shadow Minister of Minerals and Energy, and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. <laughs>